Today's lecture focuses specifically on the process of protein synthesis, also known as translation. To recap what we discussed in our previous lectures was that DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid, was the storage molecule that contained all of the information or instructions necessary for a cell to function and survive. The DNA again stores all of that information and needs to be accessed during different stages of a cell or an organism's life cycle. Accessing that information occurs by the process of transcription, which again was one of the focuses of our previous lecture. Transcription is a copying mechanism that occurs on a gene-by-gene -gene basis, and the product of transcription is an RNA molecule. Now, there are some genes that are referred to as protein-coding genes, and those genes, when they are transcribed, the RNA that is produced specifically is utilized as instructions to synthesize a protein. There are, however, a number, a significant number, of non-protein-coding genes. These are genes that are also transcribed, produce a functional RNA molecule, but the RNA itself is not utilized as instructions to synthesize a protein. However, for today's lecture, we are gonna focus on the mechanism of translation, or also known as protein synthesis. Hence, we will be focusing on those genes, or subset of genes, known as protein coding genes. The mechanism known as protein synthesis, or translation, requires some components in order for the process to take place. Those components include the messenger RNA, which is the RNA copy that is produced via transcription of protein coding genes. There is a need for molecules known as transfer RNA or tRNA. These molecules in summary are middlemen that translate the information between the language of nucleic acids found in the messenger RNA and amino acids that are the building blocks for proteins. Ribosomes are also required. Ribosomes are the protein synthesizing machines. These are structures within the cell that read the information and help synthesize the proteins. Protein synthesis requires a great deal of energy input, and hence ATP is required in order for protein synthesis to occur. In addition, there are a whole handful of other enzymes that are collectively referred to as translation factors, and their job is to help various stages of the protein synthesis or translation process. So let's first look at the messenger RNA that is synthesized when protein coding genes are transcribed. Messenger RNA is a single-stranded RNA molecule, and it is a copy of the gene that, again, is the instructions or the information to synthesize a specific protein. If you recall, when we talked about transcription in our last lecture, for eukaryotic genes, transcripts, or messenger RNA, have post-transcriptional modifications that occur which include the addition of a structure at the 5' prime end, known as the 5' prime cap, as well as a structure at the 3' prime end, known as the poly A tail. In addition, if you look at the figure here in front of you, what you can see in the red would be the portion of the transcript that actually contains the instructions. What this is showing you is that there is a portion at the 5' prime end as well as at the three prime end, highlighted in the pink color, that is not utilized as instructions to synthesize a protein. These are referred to as untranslated regions. One of the next key players in the protein synthesis or translation process is a structure referred to as the ribosome. Every single cell, no matter if it is prokaryotic or eukaryotic contains ribosomes, as ribosomes are defined as protein synthesizing machines. Their job is to read the information present in an RNA molecule and synthesize a protein 
based off of the information or the instructions that are provided by that RNA molecule. The ribosome itself is made up of two distinct subunits, one referred to as the small subunit and one referred to as the large subunit. In this figure, you can see some additional components labeled as initiation factors and elongation factors. These I refer to collectively as translation factors, and they are additional proteins that help the protein synthesis process along. If you look back at the ribosome, I want to focus on a couple of additional structures. Specifically, there are caverns or divots within the ribosome itself. These are referred to, starting from the left-hand side, as the E site, in the middle, the P site, and on the right, the A site. The E site stands for the exit site, and this is where an additional molecule that we will talk about in just a minute sits temporarily before it exits the ribosome. The P site stands for peptidyl transfer RNA binding site, and the A site stands for amino acyl tRNA binding site. And we will come back to those structural components in a little bit. So in our previous lecture dealing with transcription, one particular slide I had in that lecture utilized or depicted what you see here on the right-hand side of this slide. This is referred to as the coding dictionary, and that is because as I prefaced in the last lecture, the information that is found in the RNA, again, the copy of the gene that has been made, is read three nucleotides at a time. Those three nucleotide words are referred to as codons, and there are 64 possible combinations of codons that exist, and that is what you see in this table, again referred to as the coding dictionary. The coding dictionary is universal, meaning that this dictionary applies to all organisms, prokaryotic and eukaryotic. There are a few exceptions, but for our purposes, we're not going to focus on those very few exceptions. We will stick with the terminology that the coding dictionary is, in fact, universal. I also mentioned in the last lecture that you will never have to memorize this table, but you should be able to utilize the information here. If you were given a codon, you should be able to extrapolate what amino acid that codon codes for. This leads me into the next really important functional component of protein synthesis, which is a molecule or a family of molecules known as tRNA or transfer RNA. Transfer RNA is a molecule that acts as a middleman between the language of nucleotides found in the RNA as a codon to then allow for the insertion of a specific amino acid dictated by the sequence in the RNA. Transfer RNA, or tRNA, is in fact a type of molecule that is the product of a non-protein coding gene. Genes exist that code for these RNA molecules, but these RNA molecules themselves are not instructions to synthesize a protein. They are, however, utilized in the protein synthesis process. What you see here in this figure are two different depictions of what transfer RNA looks like. The one on the left is a little more of an accurate molecular description of a transfer RNA molecule, and the one on the right is obviously an idealized cartoon version of a transfer RNA molecule. The important point is that tRNA molecules are molecular interpreters. That is, they are the go-between RNA and amino acids in order for protein synthesis to take place. If you look at this figure, you can see highlighted on both versions of the molecule something that is referred to um, at the bottom of the figure as the anticodon. And the anticodon is a set of three nucleotides that specifically binds to the codon in the RNA molecule. 
and we'll see a highlight of that in just a little bit. At the opposite end of the tRNA molecule, you see what's referred to as the amino acid attachment site. This is specifically where amino acids are covalently linked to the tRNA because the transfer RNA molecule is going to bring those amino acids to the ribosome to allow for protein synthesis to occur. So let's look at the ribosome again in a little more simplified view. What you see here is an intact ribosome with the small subunit on the bottom and the large subunit on the top, and together they are an intact ribosome. What you also see here are two of the sites that I mentioned previously, the P site and the A site. The P site stands for peptidyl tRNA binding site, and the A site stands for amino acyl tRNA binding site. What is not shown on this simplified figure is the exit site, and for our purposes that's not so important, it is just a location where tRNAs sit temporarily after they have donated an amino acid to protein synthesis. Now what I have yet to mention is that the ribosome itself is made up of numerous proteins. In eukaryotes, there are up to 80, approximately 80 distinct proteins that make up the ribosome. There are also RNA molecules known as ribosomal RNA or rRNA that are functional components of an intact ribosome. This too is an example of a RNA molecule that is the product of a non-protein coding gene. It is transcribed, the RNA is functional, but it itself is not instructions to synthesize a protein. It is a structural and important functional component of every single ribosome. Okay, so let's look at how the process of translation begins. What needs to occur is the ribosome, the messenger RNA, and the initial tRNA need to all come together to form what's known as an initiation complex. At the end of protein synthesis, which we'll get to in just a little bit, the two subunits of the ribosome dissociate from one another. So in order to initiate protein synthesis, the two subunits must be brought back together again in order for the functional ribosome to exist. So for the initiation of translation, the two subunits need to come together, the messenger RNA and the very first tRNA. There are translation factors that help this association along. And what I also want to mention is that Protein synthesis does not occur at the very end of the messenger RNA. As noted on the slide where the RNA was shown, I highlighted the red portion of the sequence that was where the information or the instructions were contained. The pink portion on either side at the five prime end and at the three prime end are referred to as untranslated regions. These are regions that do not contain instructions for the synthesis of a protein. Therefore, it is really important for all of the assembly of the components to come together in such a way that protein synthesis begins at the same point for every single messenger RNA. This occurs at a location known as the start codon. So again, in our previous lecture, I did mention with the coding dictionary, there was at least one codon that you needed to know. That codon is AUG, and AUG codes for the insertion of the amino acid methionine. But what you can see highlighted now on this figure in the red is the AUG start codon sequence in the messenger RNA. The very first tRNA is in position and you can see the anti-codon portion of the tRNA is hydrogen bonding via sequence complementarity to the codon. And I also mentioned in several lectures previous to this 
that this sequence complementarity concept was going to come back over and over and over again. And here we are seeing it once more. Lastly, I want to mention that this very first tRNA that is binding to the start codon um, is also sitting in what is known as the P site of the ribosome. The very next step in this process is the addition of a second tRNA. As you can see, that second tRNA coming in from the right of the slide. The specific way that this tRNA interacts with the messenger RNA is exactly the same as I just showed you in the previous slide. The codon in the messenger RNA and the anticodon in the tRNA hydrogen bond by sequence complementarity. And more specifically, you can see that the second tRNA sits in what's known as the A site of the ribosome. Now we have everything in position for the very first peptide bond to form between these two amino acids that have been brought very close together and specific amino acids based on the sequence dictated by the messenger RNA. So the next step is to allow for peptide bond formation to occur between those two amino acids. And as such, once that peptide bond is formed, the amino acid from the very first tRNA is released and the tRNA can actually move. You can see that here on this slide. This is referred to as translocation. This is a physical movement of the ribosome from one position to the next. And the tRNA that has donated its amino acid is leaving the ribosome. You now have a tRNA that has a growing polypeptide chain associated with it. This is referred to as a peptidyl tRNA. The peptidyl tRNA sits in the P site. And in this next step, you now have the A site ready, vacant, and available for the next tRNA to come into position. How does the next tRNA come into position? The exact same way. The codon sequence in the messenger RNA dictates what tRNA will come into place with sequence complementarity. And you will again have amino acids that are in very close proximity to one another, and a peptide bond can form between the two. This process is repeated over and over and over again as long as there is information in the messenger RNA that dictates codons that require anticodons to come into position. So looking at the very top of the slide at 12 o'clock, you see the situation where the A site is available. This is a step that has occurred after translocation like we just talked about. As you can see, the next tRNA is coming into position. If we follow around clockwise at 3 o'clock, what you can see is the tRNAs in position, peptide bond forming between the neighboring amino acids, and the next step at 6 o'clock is the translocation step and the removal of the tRNA that has donated its amino acid. This process, again, continues over and over and over again until a codon known as a stop codon is in the A site. There are three stop codons, and again, you don't have to have them memorized, but there are three specific stop codons that do not have a corresponding tRNA that bind to them. This is an indication to stop the protein synthesis process. Those translation factors that I mentioned that are proteins that help protein synthesis along recognize this pause in the process and begin the termination of protein synthesis. What happens at the termination of protein synthesis? The polypeptide chain is removed from the peptidyl tRNA. That polypeptide chain can now go fold into a final functional conformation. The two subunits of the ribosome dissociate, like I mentioned at the beginning of the protein synthesis component of this lecture, and the messenger RNA falls away.
the messenger RNA can be utilized again to be um, used as instructions to synthesize a protein once again. The ribosomal subunits can also come back together and produce an intact ribosome, and so this process can continue over and over and over again. And this is a really simple figure just to highlight the information that is found in the messenger RNA, which is across the top of the slide. You can see the 5' prime end of the messenger RNA. You can also see the start codon, or the AUG. Um, each one of the codons, as you see, codes for the insertion of a specific amino acid. And as the ribosome continues to read the information and the instructions in the messenger RNA, proteins are synthesized with a specific sequence of amino acids, like you see here. AUG, coding for the insertion of the amino acid methionine. Next, CAC, coding for the insertion of the amino acid histidine. GUU, coding for the insertion of the amino acid valine. AAA, coding for the insertion of the amino acid lysine. CCU, coding for the insertion of the amino acid proline, and so on. So this is obviously a very short snippet, but it shows you that direct relationship between the sequence in the messenger RNA and the sequence of amino acids that is being put together in the protein synthesis process. The tRNAs are also recyclable. Every tRNA that has donated an amino acid can be utilized to participate in protein synthesis once again, simply with the addition of another amino acid. There are a family of enzymes that are referred to as amino acyl tRNA synthetases. There are in fact 20 of these distinct enzymes for each of the 20 amino acids. The substrates for these enzymes are tRNA, as well as the correct amino acid that needs to be covalently linked to it. These enzymes then allow for the addition of the correct amino acid to the tRNA, and hence the tRNA can now go and participate in protein synthesis all over again. So putting this all back together in a typical eukaryotic cell, we know that there is compartmentalization that takes place between different components of the cell, as well as different stages in this flow of genetic information. In eukaryotes, the DNA is housed inside the nucleus, hence transcription occurs in the nucleus of a eukaryotic cell. The RNA processing steps that we discussed, the addition of the cap and the addition of the tail, as well as splicing all occur within the nucleus before the messenger RNA is considered mature and can exit the nucleus of the cell. Once the messenger RNA enters into the cytoplasm, we can see the process of protein synthesis taking place in the cytoplasm of the cell. So again, just highlighting that compartmentalization. I also wanted to go back to the five prime cap and the three prime poly A tail. When we discuss these components uh, during the transcription lecture, I mentioned that their job is to add a layer of protection to protect the messenger RNA from enzymes that would degrade the messenger RNA, basically making the ends unrecognizable to these enzymes. In addition, both the cap and the tail play a role in efficient protein synthesis. So they not only add a layer of protection to the messenger RNA from being degraded, but also are essential for getting efficient protein synthesis to occur. So again, in an attempt to put all of the puzzle pieces back together again, we discussed briefly that DNA was the storage molecule that contained all of the instructions necessary for a cell to be able to function and survive. Those genes get copied in a process known as transcription to produce RNA molecules. However, what we focused on mostly in this lecture were those genes known as protein coding genes.
What I want to highlight now is a concept that I'm introducing now and we will discuss in our next lecture, which is how mutations can arise, one way that mutations can arise, and specifically what result that might have. A mutation is defined as any change in nucleotide, nucleotide sequence of DNA in comparison to a reference sequence. So simply, it is a change in the DNA sequence. Mutations can or cannot cause uh, dramatic effects to occur in this cell where these mutations take place. If you look on the left-hand side, this is a specific example where a single nucleotide difference in DNA sequence can have very dramatic effects. Individuals who have sickle cell anemia have misshapen red blood cells due to the fact that there is a mutation in their gene that codes for the protein known as hemoglobin. On the left hand side, you can see a snippet of the normal hemoglobin gene. When it is transcribed, you can see the transcript in the red. And when that transcript is utilized in protein synthesis, you get what is quote unquote referred to as normal hemoglobin. Individuals with sickle cell anemia have a single nucleotide mutation, meaning there's a nucleotide that is different in these individuals' gene coding for hemoglobin. That difference is highlighted um, in that figure on the right-hand side. There's an A in that middle position of that codon, whereas there is a T on the left-hand side in the normal hemoglobin. When the mutated gene has been transcribed. That transcription result is also copied and carried over into the messenger RNA. The codon in the messenger RNA, instead of coding GAA, codes GUA. And this is insertion of a different amino acid than what we see in the normal hemoglobin. The single change has very dramatic effects in the way that the protein folds, hence causing the misshapen red blood cells overall. What you see in this slide is a highlight of different terms associated with mutations. Mutations, as we will talk about in our next lecture, can be categorized in lots of different ways, but simple examples are presented in this table. A mutation can be a substitution basically where you have a DNA base or nucleotide that has simply been substituted for another. In these cases, depending upon what the substitution is, can result in dramatic effects. So you can have something that's referred to as a silent mutation, and that results in no change in amino acid sequence. If you go back to the coding dictionary, you will see that there is something referred to as redundancy. There are 64 different codons and only 20 different amino acids. That means there are repeats or synonyms with codons that code for the same amino acid insertion. So if you have one sequence and it has been substituted for another, there is a chance that the substitution is referred to as a silent mutation because even though there is a nucleotide difference, it doesn't result in the change of amino, in an amino acid. Alternatively, you can have something referred to as a missense mutation. And a missense mutation is where amino acids are changed due to the substitution. The example we just looked at with sickle cell anemia is in fact a missense mutation. There is a different amino acid that gets inserted because of this nucleotide change. Lastly, it could be what's referred to as a nonsense mutation. And a nonsense mutation is a change in amino acid codon to become a stop codon. This prematurely stops the protein synthesis process. You get what's referred to as a truncated protein. Typically, they are non-functional and these are typically very dramatic um, in effect overall. Lastly, on this slide in this table, there are mutations that are referred to as insertions or deletions. These are when additional nucleotides are added in or taken out. 
and these mutations alter the reading frame and typically are very detrimental for the end result of a protein.